All right, we'll start. I don't know what's going on. I don't need the projector for the first couple of things I'm going to do. A couple of announcements. So um, for any of you, um, I'm part of the pre-health committee. Okay, so if you're part of the pre-health club, you've probably already gotten this email and the shared document. If there's anybody in here who potentially could have an interview this semester, okay, this semester, I sent out the email. I can share the Google Doc calendar uh, scheduler with you. I'm in charge of setting up all of the mock interviews for the fall. Just to give you an idea how we do this in case you don't know, uh, and this is for the entire campus. It, it used to be just biology and neuro and chem. The entire campus. In the spring, if you want to go to DO school, MD school, or dental school, those usually happen in the spring because they require a committee letter. They're the only three schools that require committee letters. And so that's a separate process. All of those people should have gone through that process in the spring. Everybody else, PT, OT, um, podiatry, optometry, nursing, um, graduate school. If you have applied and you might have an interview this semester, you should probably and you didn't get the email because you weren't on my list, you should let me know and I can share the Google scheduler with you because we've got four days that we're going to do this. The way we used to do this on campus is there was a small group of biology and chemistry professors and whenever somebody would have an interview set up then they would come screaming to us and be like, I need a mock interview and we would get together and it was hodgepodge and we're trying to avoid this hodgepodgeness because it takes up a lot of time out of our schedule, so we're trying to schedule that. If it applies to you, if it doesn't apply to you, fine. If you know somebody, maybe, who's in this position and for some reason isn't on the mailing list for the pre-health club or just doesn't know about it, but you know they've applied to one of these types of schools and would like a mock interview, then they should contact me and I will share the document with them. Okay? So that's one. But it could be you. The second one is a shameless plug. Um, Denise Cook and I are um, going to have a brand new J-term course. I know it's a little bit early, but thinking about registering. Um, it's called Human Neurophysiology. It's not only an advanced biology course, um, it's, it could be used as an advanced neuro course. It's a Carthus Symposium, if you need one of those. Um, and it is also a 4,000 level biology slash neuro course, which means it's the highest level of course that you can have on this campus. It's the only advanced physiology course we have right now. So it's at the level of immuno. That's how high of a level this course is. So there will be eight spots for neuro students. And neuro, all you have to be as a neuro student is to add neuro two. And there will be eight spots for everybody else. For everybody else, you need to have had bio 1100 or 1120, but most of you wouldn't have had 1120 because that's a new sequence, and some what? Those are the pre -rings. okay? So, anyway, those, that's the course. If you need a course um, and you're eligible, that's something to think about. So, that's my shameless plug. You can uh, tell your friends. Okay, what I want to do is I want to start with a Martino moment because this one has to do with studying. 
and specific for this class. So I think it's relevant, so I'd rather just start with it. That way I know I have time. You do a lot of rote memorization in this class, right? And there's better ways and good ways and not so good ways to do rote memorization. If you don't know what rote memorization is, that's just where you memorize things, right? You don't have any concept of what that word necessarily means. You just straight out memorize it. You go to the dictionary, you memorize words. That's all rote memorization is. Now, you can optimize that. You'd have to do a lot of it in this class. There's no way around it. So how do you optimize it? Well, there's something called the curve of forgetting. And I'm going to show you what the curve of forgetting is. Okay, so this is in days. You know what, I'm not going to test you on this. This is to help you do better in any course that you have to do this in. All right, um, so on the y-axis, 0 to 100 is the percent of retention, how much you actually hold on to, right? That's the important part. Because you want, it, ideally, ideally we would all have photographic memories right, and we would retain 100%, then the, the fallacy of a photographic memory is one that is very pervasive. I mean, there aren't very many human beings on the planet that truly have a photographic memory. I think we've identified 10, something like that. There aren't that many truly have a photographic memory, meaning that they never forget anything. It just, it's, they're freaks of nature, right? That's a truly photographic memory. Most of us aren't that good. We're better, we're on the spectrum, but we're just not that good, right? If you have one, if you're one of those 10, then by all means, you know, shut your brain off, turn your iPhone on, and listen to some tunes for a few minutes. It's probably not gonna be worth your time and effort. On the bottom here, on the x-axis is days, and I have from one to 25. Okay, so let's say you're in, you're in the lab. Okay, because a lot of this happens in the lab, but you're also going to rote memorize some of the stuff from the book, right? Or some of the stuff that I say in lecture. That's understandable. Okay, you're in the lab and you spent the day on the parts of the bones in the legs. <clears throat> All right, so you got your femur, your tibia, the fibula. And, there's, and all of the markings, because the markings, there's a lot of markings on them too. It's not just the bones, right? And you spent all of that time. So this would be zero, the zero point. And we're going to assume, right? We're going to assume that you're gonna start here, right? That assumes that you actually got, let's say you had 20 parts, you memorized all 20 parts. Does that make sense to everybody? And you got it, meaning that you did it 5, 10, 20 times, and you know them. Okay, that's the assumption you have to start with, that you have 100% retention at the some point. Okay, or else the whole thing gets screwed up. Okay, you start. Now, what starts to happen? This is the curve of forgetting, right? What actually starts to happen is something like this. And so if you never touch that stuff again, for most people, that's probably what would happen over a three-week period or so. Not all of it. Some people retain stuff better. It's more interesting to them. It's complicated, right? If you really, really like something, sometimes you don't pay attention that well, but you get it anyway. And if you really, really don't like something, then it's probably going to be faster. But, so there's a spectrum. But just, just stay with me. On average, that's probably close to what's going to happen to your memory. Now, the question is, well, how do, you, how do you do this so that it, it doesn't happen? Well, part of it is studying, right? So 
So within 24 hours of the time that you learn that, and assuming that we're at 100% retention, you have to touch that material again. 24 hours, okay? That's the window you have. Because in that window, in that window, you, you retain a lot. Because your short-term memory is what you're working on here in the hippocampus, right? And would you want to ultimately transfer this to your long-term memory? If you've constantly been, and I'm assuming that most of your juniors and seniors, maybe there's a couple of sophomores in here. If you've been operating on the binge and purge, I'm just going to use my short-term memory for the last three or four years, you know that that just doesn't work very well at college. It, there comes a point where it's going to bite you in the butt. So you've got to transfer more stuff to long-term memory. That's where you retain stuff for a couple of weeks, a couple of months, ultimately years. That would be the ideal, right? Okay. So this will start to happen, right? You start going down this curve until here. So if you touch it again, somewhere between that, then, then something like that happens, right? The curve does not keep decremented. Okay, so this, the nice thing about this curve and what I'm about to show you is efficiency. And if you're super busy, which most of you are, you have to find a way to memorize or learn in the most efficient manner, right? It would be ideal if all you ever did was study, but that's just not the world we live in, right? Then, then this is irrelevant. Like, you're all studying all the time, it doesn't matter. But you're not, because you have other commitments. Okay, so now you're at 24 hours, you've touched it again, right? Meaning that you've, you've had to have tested yourself to make sure that, in fact, those 20 pieces of information are still there. You have to have evidence. Prove it to yourself. Not like you looked it over and said, well, I looked it over again in 24 hours. That doesn't work. Make a sheet, get the structures with numbers, and then label them again and get the 20 right. That's what I'm talking about. If you don't do that, then this, again, doesn't work. Right? You, you really, your curve is still going in this direction. Does that make sense, everybody? Just looking it over is not studying. Does it, I mean, I'm assuming everybody understands this. Like, if you look at a book, I had a student in this class three years ago, and this is what he did. He would come into the lab, and he, he wouldn't talk to anybody, and he would open up the book, and he would sit there with a model for three hours. A couple of models, he'd grab them, and, and I went up to him, and I asked him how he was doing, he said, fine. And all he would do was look at stuff. And he was getting Ds in my class. So finally, after the second D, I said to him, I said, how do you study? Like, what, what are you doing? And take me through this process. And he would come in, and he'd show me exactly what I'd see. He'd see the book. And he said, I would read the structure, and then I would close my eyes, and then I'd read it and repeat it to myself. Does that sound like a good way to study? Are you retaining anything? He put in a lot of work. He did. He tried. He wasn't lazy, right? This wasn't problematic. But he just sat there, and he read stuff. I said, I said, how do you know that you know? And he said, what do you mean? I said, how do you know that you know? Like, what proof have you? The reason you test yourself or you quiz yourself is to know that you know, right? That's why I test you. Not just for the grades. I mean, you think it might be, but it's not. It's so that I know that you know the information, right? So that I can make a recommendation. The grade ultimately is a recommendation. I said, how do you know that you know the stuff? Well, I read it, and I've been here for three hours. And then I go home and I read it. But did you test yourself? Well, no. Why would I do that? Well, then how do you know? You just don't know. You, you can't operate that way. Now, it, this may sound completely and utterly ridiculous, but I assume nothing here. I'm trying to help everybody, right, by, by what I'm doing here. So I'm not going to make any assumptions or judgments here. But I saw it. If I hadn't had this conversation with this person, I would have thought, like, this is like something out of the Twilight Zone. Like, nobody actually does this. But that's how he did it. And he basically ended up getting a D minus in the class and had to retake it. That's not very shocking. Okay? So it does happen. Okay. So you have to test yourself. Prove it to yourself. Have somebody else test you. Okay? You got 18 out of 20 right. Maybe that's good enough. So then your line doesn't go up to there. Your line is now here. But it's still better than that, right? Everybody agree? 
Okay, everybody agrees. Okay, so now the question is, do you need to touch that stuff again within 24 hours? And the answer, according to the studies, the research shows no. You don't. You can. You can, and if you're doing it, I'm not telling you not to, right? I'm not telling you not to. I'm just saying that you don't have to. And, and because what starts to happen is this will start decrementing again like this. And the slope of the curve is essentially always the same, right, roughly. You've got three days now. Assuming you really put it into your memory the first two times, you don't have to touch it again for three days. Now if in three days you touch it again, and again you get yourself back up to this theoretical value, now you're back. So when have you touched it? You touched it the first time, 24 hours, and now three days after that. Now, assuming again, right, the premise is that you, you got it. Not you sort of got it or you read it. That doesn't work, right? Is everybody with me? Okay, so now when do you have to touch it again? A week. Okay, so now you start again. If you touch it again, now you're back up to here. Now, we're going to start to assume that you're going to start to lose some of this only because a little bit because you've got other things going on. But you're pretty high up. You're like 98%. That's pretty darn good. Okay? Now when do you need to do it again? Three weeks. Now I've got two weeks on there only because I didn't want to go out. That's how your memory works. That's how efficient you can be. So, and then three weeks will be out, out here somewhere. So if that piece of, if those 20 pieces of information, in the most efficient way that you can regurgitate them <coughs> is to touch them one, two, three, four, five times. That's what your goal is, right? Because now you've got it in long-term memory. That's the reason you're able to retain it, because it's not short-term. If you've been operating on the short-term model, it doesn't work, because by definition, that's what short-term memory is, not very long, okay? This is long. Does that make sense to everybody? So if you're very, very busy, you're an athlete, you've got all kinds of other things pulling at you, it's not about hitting it every day. Would it be better? Sure. Absolutely it would be better. It would be better, but if you're pinched for time, you can still do well and retain a lot more than you're doing now with a simple trick because this is how your memory works. But it's a frequency thing, no? So if, but if you do, now, now let's take someone that hits it every day. They're hitting it more frequently. Are they gonna embed it even better in their brain? Of course they will. But, okay, the example I always use is medical school. Okay, we, we just use 20 items, right? 20 items, everybody probably could do that, right? That's not, is that overwhelming for anybody to memorize 20 items in three hours? Probably not, right? Okay, now imagine you get to medical school, okay? And we're using that as the extreme example because that's sort of the ultimate test here, right? As one, at a super high level. Do you think in medical school you have three hours to memorize 20 structures? No. Because basically they're throwing the phone book at you every day. I mean, I've been at them. What The amount of information that you have to assimilate, and this is not just medical school, PT school is the same way, PA school is the same way. I've had PAs, uh, students of mine that, that are PAs now, and they came back and they brought back their notes, they're like, Martino, that's one hour's lecture right there. No. <coughs> I can't leave them with you because they're not allowed to, right? But like, they show you the amount of information that you get thrown at you, and it's like, that's one, one hour's worth of stuff. I'm like, I know, right? So how do you do that? Well, you have to have a photographic memory. No, you don't. No, you don't. It is a complete fallacy. It is a complete fallacy. Anybody and everybody can do this. But if you tell yourself, I have to have a photographic memory to do this, then what does it do? It gives you an out, doesn't it? It gives you an out. Because then, well, I couldn't do it because they had photographic memories and I don't. That's baloney. It's complete bull. It is an excuse and a lame one at that, right? So, so let's take, you have a lot more information thrown at you. Well, how do you do that? 
they have the equivalent of like 27 undergraduate credits. That's what one semester in medical school is like. Okay? That's what it's like. And they go from whatever it is. I had a friend of mine who's head anesthesiologist in Michigan. We worked together many, many years ago at the medical college. And what ended up happening is when he started medical school, this is what he did. This was his schedule every day, right? He would wake up at 4 o'clock in the morning, and he would study from 4 o'clock to 7 o'clock a.m. Then he would have breakfast because he was already married with his wife, okay? And then he would be in class from 8 a.m. in the morning until 5 or 6 in the evening, okay? Then he would go home and have dinner with his lovely wife. Then he would come back to the medical college and study until 1 o'clock in the morning. That was his first two years. So you figure out how much sleep he got a day. He started to break out acne. He started to lose his hair. He started to get a little grumpy. Because of the, and he was a 395 student from the UW Stevens Point. Double major. He wasn't stupid. And that's how hard he had to work. Okay, so why am I telling you that? I'm not trying to impress you. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm just saying that's a lot of information, right? This now becomes even more important. I gave this exact same lecture, the very first lecture I ever gave on this campus eight years ago. The letter that you got from Coriana Anderson, she was in that class. She was my best student all year long. I gave this lecture, she did what she did. She went off to medical school. She came back two years later to visit me because she would visit myself and Dr. Christine Blaine every year. She visited us, okay? And she told me, we sat down one day and she said, Martina, you remember that whole memory thing that you told us about when my very first class, your very first lecture? I said, yes. I thought you were full of shit. That's what she told me, my best student in my class. I love this girl. I got a picture of her in my office at graduation, right? I said, I thought you were full of crap. And I said, okay, here we go. So that's great. Well, it worked out for you anyway. So what? Doesn't matter, right? She says, but here's the funny thing. When I got to medical school, the way I was operating at Carthage didn't work anymore. And she's my best student, right? She, she graduated magna cum laude with a chemistry major, which means that she had better than 3.75 GPA, Q. Okay, she's pretty smart. She's like, it didn't work anymore. I said, so what did you do? Remember that crappy thing that you told us I thought it was full of crap? It actually works. That's what she said to me. It actually works. I'm like, well, lo and behold, the old man may actually know something. Okay, so the point of this is you too can use this. If you're not already using it, try it. It works great for index cards. The, the key is frequency, right? The more times you touch something, the more you're going to retain it. It's not about spending two or three hours a day. If you have it, it's fine, right? But it's about at least hitting it 15 minutes, 10 minutes. Can everybody get 10 minutes? Does anybody waste 10 minutes on anything? Maybe when you're in the bathroom, bring the cards with you. Not the weirdest thing that ever goes into there, right? But 10 minutes, a couple of times a day, is better for you to retain this type of information and do things like this than it would be to study for hours and hours. So when you're in the lab, so when you're in the lab, right, break your three hour period into smaller, more manageable chunks and then distract yourself. Why do I give you Martino moments? Because I just want to tell stories? I mean, I like to talk, but I don't just do them. I do it because I realize your, your attention span is gone. By midway, usually, it's gone. And I've lost most of you, even the best of you, because it doesn't matter what I'm talking about. By breaking that for even a couple of minutes and then starting again, now I got you again. Because you remember, when you study, if this is a three hour block, right? And here's the first piece of information, and here's the last piece of information. The two that you remember the best are that very first and that very last piece. If that's true, if it's true, then if you have more firsts and last, right? If you then take this and you break it into one, two, 
three, four, five, six, seven. So which way are you better off? Studying for a three hour block where you have two pieces of information that maybe are solid, or for breaking it up into one, two, three, four, five, six sections? Well, it's a no-brainer, right? This seven pieces of information. You've more than tripled the amount of information you've stored. That's pretty efficient, okay? Now, this works really well for rote memorization. It doesn't work well for understanding, right? But in anatomy, think about it this way. We're giving you the language of medicine, of healing, right? This is the foundational course. You have to understand the language to understand everything that comes after it and to be able to understand more complicated processes. If you don't know the language, it's hard to understand the more complicated stuff. Does that make sense? So that's what I'm giving you here. I want you all to succeed. If every one of you gets an A, that's cool. It's never happened before, but it's cool. I'm good with that. Like, there's, I don't have any limit in my head like, well, I've got 15 I can give. Maybe I'll give 16. I don't care. Get, it, get all get A's. Make me happy, right? But use this is one of many tricks. I got a lot of them. Okay, I got a lot of, them. and they work for everybody. That's the thing. This is not some magic that nobody, that only a few people can make work. This everybody can make work. Okay, frequency. Hit it a little bit at a time. Even if it's just 10 minutes, you're waiting for. That's what Coriana said, right? She carried the cards everywhere. Frequency. So she was sort of already doing it. It just wasn't very systematic like this. This is much more systematic. Okay? Anybody have any questions on that? I spent a little bit more time than I wanted to, but I think it's important because I want you to succeed, right? I want you to do well. I'm trying to help you here, so this is worth my time and worth your time to do it. Does that make sense? Okay. If at any time, you know, you want any more tricks or hints, just ask during the semester. Like I said, I've got a lot of them, but just something to help. Okay. Remind me of three most important things from last time. So somebody put that call on. saying, well, what about the apical part of the cell? You can't keep having to look through your notes and saying, well, what does that mean? Apical, that's the top. Okay. Katie. Um, so you are uh, like the structures of the Yes, the structures. Know how to draw them. If you can draw them out, again, that will enhance your memory. It's just easier to remember them. I'll let you. So all of the junctions, and then and that was an important point that she made, is that tight junctions, remember, are technically two junctions put together, right? There's the occludens, right? And then there's the actual adherent. The adherent can sit in a junction area by itself, but the tight junction usually has the adherent as a two-part mechanism, right? Tight junction. Questions from last time? Any any questions on anything we did so far? Yeah, Zach. Exactly. So for the adherence, uh, is that just referring to the coherent of the The adherent? I'm talking about the whole structure. The coherent is, is just part of that. It's part of the plaque. Okay. Right? Then what would, so I'm, I'm a little confused yeah. about the adherence and the Okay, so if, you, if you're looking at a junction between a cell, right? If you're looking at a, a cell and you've got a plasma membrane here and you've got a plasma membrane here, the, the tight junction, the structure we looked at, looked something like this, right? It's like this beaded belt, right? 
And this is considered what's called zona occludens. That's the actual part that most people refer to as the tight junction, because this is the water sealing part. Okay? Associated with that, associated with that, you have this is the inside of the cell. And then this is the inside of the cell here. Right? You have this adherin, right, that has these adhesion belts on it, right? And this one is often referred to as zona adherin. Technically, these two together are the tight junction. Right? Here's the waterproofing part, and here's the part that actually brings the two pieces together. So you can find this alone without that, but you can't find this without that. Right, because this one isn't so much structural as it's waterproofing. This one is the really the one that holds it tight. And so, yeah, Leonard. Does that mean that there's no like specific adherence junction all of them? Yeah, they're they're alone. You can find them alone. Okay. They, so they can be found alone. Yeah, Eliza. Why is this tight junction for They they're not they're not completely waterproof. One junction alone will not waterproof, but a series of them together. So by adding a tight junction, right, it, there's le it's less likely that water will flow between those two cells, but it can't keep water out. If you really want to keep water out, you'd have multiple tight junctions all the way along. And the more of them you add, the more water resistant it becomes. And then on top of that, you usually have some kind of movement some other kind of hydrophobic molecule that sort of seals the deal for you. But yeah, so tight junction, one tight junction, it'll slow the water down, but it's not going to keep it out. Yeah, that's right. Any other questions? Good, good question. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the Jordan. The protein that will the adherence together or adherence, are they the same proteins that will be able to include? Yes. The yeah. occludins, the cadherin. They're both cadherin. Yes. They're both cadherins. Cadherin, cadherin. Right? The integrin, the only exception to the rule for the, the protein that we talked about was in the, in the what? The hemidesmosome, and that's an integrin, right? So that's the one. If you can remember that the hemidesmosome is the integrin, the rest of them all kept here. Because remember, they, it's, the hemidesmosome, even though it's a half structure, it's physically more robust, right? The parts are just bigger. And so it's a different kind of protein that does that. But same idea, CJ. Uh, always like, use to bind the cells to the basement membrane? Yes. Okay. They're always, they always and only bind to the basement membrane. That's their job. And that's the only reason that that big structure works. Because if it was into another cell, the basement membrane has, is more foundational. If you were to try to put an integrant from one cell to the next, it would tear that other cell apart. Because there's no there's no reinforcement structure in there. Because it's again, it's like putting footings into bedrock, right? A stone versus putting it into like a marshy area. And the cell is more like a marshy area, whereas the base membrane is more like that clay or really the bedrock type structure. Yeah. Good questions. Okay. So yeah. Go ahead. You gave, you gave us that. Um, that's yeah. You said, did you ask? Did you ask how many jumps? Yeah, good question. That's a reasonable question. So Leonard said, if I gave this picture to you on an exam and I asked you how many junctions are there, okay, if it is a fill in the blank, then I would take one or two, right, with some explanation. Because if you see this as a tight junction, technically it's one. If you just see them as individual junctions, well, there are two types of junctions there. So I'd probably give you credit for both. If it's multiple choice, this would end up being one of those tricky ones, right? There, there's one, there's two, it's, it's more than one or the other type of thing, because that would be the best answer. So that's a tricky question. But if you can write it in, as long as you can explain to me what you mean by one or two, I'd probably just give you credit for it. Because that can get really tricky very, very quickly.
And again, I, I'm usually not trying to trick you. That I don't, I don't ever go in making an exam. I've never made an exam that way. Don't do it. It's not my way of doing it. Okay. Good questions, though. Other questions. Okay. Just let me see why this thing is. <laughs> Here we go. Okay, let's see if this thing wants to turn on here for me. Last time I tried two, and that seemed to work, but I've had both work. It's, she's just got magic. Just, you're going to have to get like extra credit or something like that. Magical powers. Okay. Okay, so remind me where we ended with this group. Okay, so we did this stuff basically. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Somebody lower the lights a little bit, please. That would be great. All right, remember when I said the other day that the basement membrane has more parts? And I don't know if it was somebody in this section, but somebody in, in one of the sections said, well, isn't the, it may have been CJ, basement membrane is the basal lamina. It's not incorrect. The basal lamina, which a lot of people refer to, is a subsection of the basement membrane. And here's the picture of it. So you have these cells, these are epithelial cells, okay? These are columnar, we haven't gotten into this yet. The, the layer that the hemidesmosome actually physically attaches to, which is here, is called the basal lamina. Okay, lamina, lamination, like you have a card, right? Your ID cards maybe are laminated, maybe they're not, I don't know. Actually, do they laminate them anymore? I think they are. I think they are. Um, old types of uh, ID cards actually used to have this big lamination with this transparency on it. You may have had those types of cards. When you laminate something, you actually add strength. One of the ways, I, and the, exam, the best example I can give you is when you're trying to, let's say that you're doing a renovation on your house, right? And you watch any, anybody watch these like renovation shows? Yeah, they're kind of cool, right? And, and usually what ends up happening is um, flip or flop or some of these other shows. My wife loves this stuff. Anyway, so i got to watch it because I love my wife, right? That's what we do. All right, so anyway, so we watch these shows. And inevitably, there's, there's, the woman comes in, and she's really, really smart. And she says, that wall's got to go because we got to open this up right there in California, right? That's where they are, and so everything's expensive. And... You know, and then the first thing they ask is, is that a structural wall? Because if it's a structural wall, it's a big deal. If it's not a structural wall, you just knock it down with a sledgehammer and you're done. If it's a structural wall, then you have to put in what's called a header, a big one, which means that it's either a big piece of steel that spans from one end to the next, or you have to have what's called a structural beam in there, which has been designed. And that structural beam is made out of wood, and it's a laminated beam. They take a lot of pieces of wood and they cut it into layers 
and then they slap these layers together. What does that do to the wood? It makes it stronger than a beam that you could create from a tree. So you have standard wood, bless you. If you need to span longer distances, you can go to this laminated product, which is an engineered piece of wood, where you stack them, or then you could ultimately go to steel, right? Now, what does that mean? Why am I telling you this? Because this basal lamina, if you take a look at it, doesn't it look like there are sheets that have been glued together? In fact, that's what it looks like. And that means that this layer is really, really strong. That's what it does for it. The same thing that we do in engineering the beam because we want the room to be open instead of having these goofy beams in the middle, like this room, right? In order to have a room this wide, there has to be beams up here that are able to span from one wall to the next. If you didn't have that, right, if this was made out of wood, you'd have to have these goofy beams, right? These posts, there'd be one here, there'd be another one here, and depending on how, right? Because they're not strong enough. This basal lambda is really, really strong. It's like bedrock in, in theory, right? And so that's why when the hemidesmosomes or integrins go in there, they lock. Right? It's, a, it's going into something really, really strong. The next layer below, we're going from surface to deep, right? Superficial to deep is called the reticular <coughs> lamina. The reticular lamina is actually strong too. But the reticular lamina is actually secreted by the connective tissue. So the connective tissue is the deepest layer here. The connective tissue, these cells, the fibroblasts, secrete the reticular lamina. The epithelial cells here secrete the basal lamina. They all come together to form the basement membrane. Does that make sense to everyone? Yeah, Leonard. When you say it forms, it you just secretes the fluid that creates like that river? Yes. yes. It creates a matrix. And it, like a river, and then that river hardens. And so the basement membrane is actually made up of material that was secreted by these cells, and materials that are secreted by these cells. And it's same, they're sandwiched in between the two, and it's really, really strong. When we get to the reticular lamina, we'll, we'll talk about this again. Connective tissue, we're going to talk about the characteristics. But you can already start to see some of them, right? The basal lamina is the sheet that have been glued together and flat. The reticular lamina, what do these fibers look like in here? Visually, if you can see them. They're kind of protein-esque and they're kind of weedy and windy. There's a reason for that. So when we get there, we're going to talk about them. They're different. They're not the same. They're not secreted by the same, from the same tissue and they don't have the same function. Yeah, Teresa. Yeah, I am. I've been recording the whole time. Yes. Yeah, I don't know why it doesn't flash sometimes, but it, it should be recording. If not, I'll, I'll do the next section. But that's good. Thank you. So, uh, does the secretion of the basal lamina have anything to do with the Because I only asked that because... Meaning what way does it have to be? Since it's secreted to the bottom, why doesn't it secrete it to the basal surface? That's a good question. Uh, Leonard's question is, why doesn't the apical surface secrete the basal lamina? Anybody have any idea? Just a really broad answer to why that might be. What's that? Tight junctions? No. More, more basic than that. What? Yeah, that's as simple as that. The, the, the cell programming in the DNA, in the genetic code, it's not programmed to secrete at the apical surface. So those, that part of the cell won't do it because it's not programmed. Does it just not have it? It doesn't have the machinery. That's right. But the, but the way Jordan's thinking about it is exactly right. In, in its very basic form, it, because it's not, it's not designed to. The more complicated answer is then, well, what, what would you need and what's the hardware? Don't worry about that. Yeah, CJ. Yeah, I was going to say, like, why would that be? Yeah, so evolutionarily, why would that not be okay? At the top, because the function of the top, it depending, let's say that this is the stomach lining. Now let's say that this is the intestinal lining. 
So the tube, the lumen, right, which is the middle of a tube, the lumen, would show up right here. Everybody with me? So this is where the food passes. Let's say that these are small intestinal cells and there's actually microvilli on top. If I secrete a concrete, super solid, rock solid structure there, here, what kind of a problem do I have? You can't absorb anything, right? Is that what you're going to say, Jordan? Yeah, you can't absorb anything. So you've got to start thinking function. Even though I don't test a lot of function in this class, if you can start thinking big practically, big picture, what is actually going on here, you start seeing, oh, it doesn't make any sense. Now, at a molecular level, we can describe that, but that's not the point of this course, right? But if you had that structure here, you couldn't absorb it. Well, how does that help you? How are you going to stay alive? You can't, right? So that's, that's functionally, so that's a simple answer. But it, it's an important answer. So don't overlook simplicity, right? Don't, here's another thing that I've seen over the last eight years, that students want to jump to the most complicated answer for everything. Start simple. Work your way to complicated, right? If the simple answer will do, why give a complicated answer? Right? So if in your mind, it's because it's not practical, because here's where the anchoring point is, the basement of the house, and here's where absorption occurs, well, then you've answered your own question. You can always add detail, but don't jump to the most complicated answer right away. Okay? Good questions, though. Really, really good. All right. Um, notice that this is epithelial tissue. What don't you see in there? No? Blood vessels. Who said that? Jordan. Excellent. Blood vessels. Why? Because it's avascular. There you go. So you. But, but you do see an axon, right? Part of a nerve, because it's, it's a lot of nerves in, like think of your skin. Your skin is a lot of epithelial tissue. Your, your fingertips are super sensitive. The only reason that they're sensitive is because you've got a lot of innervation with nerves and axons. But there's no blood vessels in there, in that epithelial tissue, okay? All right, so. Some basic stuff. Basal lamina is from the epithelial cells. Collagen fibers. Collagen we're going to talk about a lot this semester. Collagen, I know in the makeup industry we talk about collagen. There's a reason for it. It makes up your skin. It's one of the most abundant proteins in your body, especially when it comes to connective tissue. Collagen. The more of it you have, the stronger the structure. Okay? So that's an important protein. The reticular lamina is secreted by the connective tissue, which is the stuff here that's very vascular, okay, because it has a blood vessel. It has reticular fibers. Those reticular fibers are, are smaller and a little bit more wavy. Now, collagen fibers are not straight, even though that lamina looks like it, they're not. So that's a little bit deceptive there with that picture. What it forms ends up being straight, but collagen fibers have a wavy too. They're different. So keep that in mind. Don't say, oh, the lamina was straight, so the collagen fibers must be straight as a board. They're not. Yep. Which fibers did you say were smaller? Oh, say that again, I can be. Which fibers did you say were smaller? The reticular fibers are smaller. Collagen fibers are bigger, they're physically thicker. All right, functions. The function of the basal of the basement membrane, right, is to guide for cell migration during development. It basically tells, gives a directionality. It's like a compass. If that's where the basement membrane is, then the cells know which direction to go based on what their function is. Okay? So it's a direction. May become thickened due to increased collagen and laminin production. Okay? May become thicker. Okay? What's on there? Calluses. Calluses. Right? This has become thickened. There's more collagen and laminin in here. Right? This can happen to all parts of your body. It happens more on your hands and feet because your hands and feet are constantly being roughed up. Right? Look at someone. If you know someone in your family, I, when we were doing construction here, it was great. We had all these big construction guys here, but 
Take a look at their hands. My father was blue collar, right? About this tall little guy, tiny, tiny, tiny. But he always worked with his hand. When my when my father would come home at night and I would touch his hand, they were like pieces of leather. That's how roughed up his hands were, right? Because what had happened is he used them every day, over and over, in order to protect his hands. The, the physiology, his body created this like leather-like, thick, beyond more than it wasn't just calloused over, right? And because he used it over and over and over again, so it was like it was it was kind of as a child the touch that was kind of weird, right? Because it's kind of really really rough. Versus my mother's hand, he was a homemaker, right? And didn't do that kind of stuff. Were really really soft. Right? But that's as a function of maybe come thick and due to increased collagen and laminin production. And you can go in both directions, right? If you stop using them for 10 years and now you get a desk job, what will happen to the roughness of that palm? The void. The body just reabsorbs it, right? So it's a use it or lose it type thing. Okay. Examples. So in diabetes mellitus, this is a disease state. The basement membrane of small blood vessels, especially those in the retina and the kidney, thickens. So the hand example that I gave you is a good adaptation. Does that make sense to everybody? Diabetes is a disease. This thickening in the retina, right, the retina is where you focus the light in your eye. That's where the macula is, the macula densa, that people know about as Generated the macular degeneration, the focal point. If that becomes thicker, your eyes, you start to lose your eyesight. That's why macular degeneration is such a big deal, and it's sped up in diabetes. In the kidneys, the tubules become thicker to defend themselves against the damage. The problem is that the damage never stops, and the damage is the sugar. The sugar causes the damage. Okay, so. There's good adaptations with this, and then there are bad adaptations. Even though the body's trying to protect itself, thickening your hands, yeah, it roughs them up a little bit, but it's not bad. Thickening of your retina and thickening of your kidney, ultimately that's going to prevent them from doing what they do. One is seeing, the other one is reabsorbing nutrients and creating your. So there's good and bad. Yeah, let's see. Oh, what is that? It's laminin. Laminin is another type of connective tissue protein. Laminin, laminin is what makes these things look straight. So the straight fibers here is laminin. And laminin has that sheet-like appearance, collagen and reticular fibers do not. Good question. Thanks. Okay, types of epithelial tissue. So I'm going to put them all up so you can write, and then I'll talk about them. Okay. Okay, so there's types. All right, so there's the two major categories here are covering and lining. That's one category. So one type of epithelial tissue covers and lines things. So for instance, like the one in your skin, the one inside your blood vessels, the one inside your airways, those are all fall under the so the epidermis of the skin is a type of epithelial tissue, right, that covers that. The lining of your blood vessels and ducts, the lining of the respiratory and the reproductive and urinary and the GI tract. The second category is glandular. This epithelial tissue doesn't line anything. It forms glands. So for instance, the thyroid gland, right? Thyroid produces T3 and T4, the most highly metabolic hormones you own. The adrenal glands, right? the adrenal glands produce things like cortisol and epinephrine and norepinephrine, right? Other things too. And then sweat glands. So the type of tissue, epithelial tissue that makes these, and the type of tissue that makes these are different. They're both epithelial tissue, but they're two categories, very different. Glandular epithelial tissue cannot cover, and covering epithelial tissue cannot form a gland. Yep. Any questions on that? Now, 
I'm going to complicate things a lot more because we're going to go into another set of subcategories based on this. So again, this is the easy one. So if you're thinking about studying and you're being strategic, right, as you're going through my PowerPoint, always go through the big topics first. So if you're using this strategy, right, say maybe I'm going to go, because you, you, maybe you're the type of person who can't take in too much information, so less is more. So the very first time you go through it, go through the big stuff. So where would the big stuff be on this slide? If you had to pick, what is the big stuff that you would memorize first? Yeah? Two types, like covering. Yeah. Exactly. Would you, the first time you go through this, would you go through all of this other rigmarole? No, you can't, because what will it do? It will confuse you, and you won't learn anything. Okay, so you go through it the first time and say, okay, there's two main types of categories. There's a covering and lining, that's one, and glandular. That's all I'm going to memorize the first time out. This is called layering. There's another concept real quick, I guess I, I should bring it up, for studying. When you study, right, if you think of a study, and I don't know what they call these in, in Asian cultures, but they have these sort of pathways that they make. I think it's Buddhist but I'm not sure. And that point there represents 100% retention. And then something out here is less, right? So every time you do this, you add another layer. So just because you're doing this, each time, this may be the most superficial layer that you're doing out. So by the time you get to three weeks, you got the superficial. But now you have to, at some point, maybe out here, now you start doing the next layer. And you do the same cycle over and over. And then hopefully by the time you get to the exam, you're at like, I don't know, 85% or better. Sort of this, another level of this, okay? All right. Classified. So classification of epithelial tissue. Now, this is the layering and the numbering system. Okay, you may have heard of this before, but you didn't understand it. I'm going to teach you. Classified, the classifications of epithelium, they're classified by the arrangement of cells into layers. When you only have one cell layer thick, that is considered simple. Okay, so you would call that simple epithelium. Meaning, and what that means translated to you is there's only one layer. That's what simple means. Not that what it does is simple, there's only one layer. Okay? Then you go to the next level. That becomes stratified. That means that you have at least two cell layers thick. Okay? That's what that means. So to a non-anatomy person, they are like, well, I don't know what that means, simple stratified. But to you, that's numbers. Simple means one, stratified means two or more. Then there's this weird one, this strange one. It's called pseudo-stratified. Now what does that mean? Defined as the cells contact the basement membrane. So the physical cell touches the basement membrane. They all do. But all cells do not reach the apical surface. Meaning that on average. So what does that look like? If you have these cells, you have a basement membrane, and you have a bunch of cells that do this. Okay, on average, wouldn't you say that this is roughly the apical surface? On average. But there are two cells in here, this one and this one. They all touch the basement membrane, but they don't reach the, the apical surface. Okay? And if they're scrunched together, if they're scrunched together and the nuclei are all over the place, to the untrained eye, this starts to begin to look like stratified epithelial tissue when in fact it's not. And I'll show you what this looks like in histology slides when we get there. Okay, we're going to show you examples of what you might see on your first lab exam. Okay, and how do you tell? You've got to look really well. Okay. 
But just to know that it's a possibility that what you're looking at, your eyes may be deceiving you. Yeah, CJ. So why would that happen? Why would that happen? I, don't, I guess I. What do you mean? Why would it happen? Like, have it, like, not stratified, but have uh, pseudo stratified cells. Yeah. Why do they exist? Arjun, do you have an answer to that, or do you have an additional question? Okay, because pseudo stratified cells can do things. Again, the simple answer that stratified cells cannot. Pseudo stratification is essentially what it looks like, not what it does, all right? And certain tissues function better by having cells of different heights because of what they do. Arjun, do you have a question? With the so what's the role of the That's essentially the same question. It's, it's there, and we'll go through it when we get there. We're gonna go through examples, but there, there are different, in other words, some cell layers require that some of the cells are not all at the same height. So, for instance, there are mucus, mucus producing cells called goblet cells, and it's sometimes beneficial that some goblet cells are actually shorter than others in your stomach because they get protected by the other cells. And we'll show you an example of that. So in that case, you actually want pseudo stratified because you're protecting those smaller cells from something they can't resist. Yeah, Leonard. Isn't there only one layer of cells? Yes. Doesn't that not that's terrible? It's pseudo. What does pseudo mean? Sort of. It's not true. Like a pseudo expert is someone who thinks he's an expert but isn't really. Right? Wouldn't that be true? I mean, it's just an example. A pseudo stratification is is actually a simple, right? Isn't isn't pseudo stratified actually just a form of simple? Yes. But but when you look at the cells, and I'm going to show you it, when you see them and you just take a quick look at it, you're going to look at it and you're going to say that's stratified layer. Right? They look like they're two not two or more cell layers there. It's not real. So they had to come up with a name, an atomist, for how to describe this. Because in true simple, true simple, there's no question. You know it's simple. But when, when they started seeing things like this, they're like, well, it's simple, but it looks stratified. So let's call it pseudo stratified. And that's how they came up with the name. The functions are usually there. Good question. Nuclei are located at multiple levels. This is where part of the issue comes. Where visually, because the nuclei are at different levels, it looks stratified, but it's not. Classified by shape. So the second classification system, right, is by shape. There's what's called squamous. Squamous cells are flat. Shape-wise, they look flat. And we'll take a look. We're going to end here with this slide. The second kind is called cuboidal. They either look round. Your typical cell that you see in a biology book is roundish. That's a cuboidal cell more than likely, or they look like a cube, right, a square. And then finally, you have columnar. And columnar are these types of cells. They look like a column, like a rectangle. The weird one is the transitional cells. Depending on what you hold them with, they can look like cuboidal, they can look squamous-like, they can look columnar. It's a very rare tissue type you have it in your body. Uh, transitional cells, some of them are in the bladder, and that, that you can understand that. Some of them are in the eye. Kind of weird why they would be in the eye. All right, very quickly, I'll do three most important things because we're out of time. Okay, I would say lots of information here. Know the difference between, this is the classification system for epithelium cell, right? Classification, memorize that, versus types. So when I say, what are the two types of epithelial tissue, you'll be like, oh, covering and lining. When I say, what are the two, what are the classifications? Oh, that's the, the number versus the shape. So again, know the language. I'll, so I'll leave it at two there, because I think those are two very, very important ones. All 
All right? I don't want to do that. We don't have an SI. Um, I, the best I can do is I could probably get an SI if, you, if anybody's interested. Um, former students that have taken the course. Um, that would be if an, okay. We can definitely. I can look into that. If that's something that you want. Yeah, students to give you some. Yeah, absolutely. Thank I will. You very much. I will. Yep. Yeah, you're welcome. I'd like to grab my name tag. It's funny. Um, oh, girl, it's probably okay. But you're here. I know. Yeah. You ask a lot of questions. I, you're you're easy. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why it's transitional because it changes its shape based on the stress that's on So yeah, and so the transitional epithelial cells, when you look at them visually, you're done. the only the only way to know. And and I don't think we've ever asked this on the lab before, is you have to see a visual, like a video of it, and just straight out memorize what transition is. Because if, you, because if you try to use the techniques, like, okay, I'm trying to, and you, let's say that you know that this is in the bladder, unless you straight out memorize it, because that cell may not look like Oh, it depends on where it is. And where it is and how it's being struck. So you straight out just have to know that these areas have transitional and that looks like a cuboidal cell. Well, it looks like a columnar cell, but it actually may be. Yeah, it's a different, different it's a fourth classification, but you don't, you can't use just a visual. Okay. You would have to either memorize it straight up or you'd have to do some further like microscopic so okay. And that's crazy. So, yeah, okay. so for the most part, for this, uh, for this class, you should know it for the lecture mm -hmm. and you should know that it exists. I, I want to say we've never asked anybody on the like, identify this and ask you okay. for a transition. You can talk to Miller about that, but I don't think we okay. do. It's kind of a nasty question because it's it really is a nasty question because if you go on by what you see, you're like, well, that's a cubic leaf. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah, not really. Right, exactly. exactly. They don't write. So visually, you'd have to mem just that's a pure rote memorization. But in my class, I'm usually just worried about you know, give me the category. Right? So mm -hmm. go back here. There are there are four classifications: um, surface shape. What are they? Oh, that's a layer. Yeah, good. Okay. Just to be aware of it. And then when you get to the next level, you go on, and then you'll get to the next level, you may see it again, but at least you'll be aware of it. And then they may just say, you've got to memorize which tissues there are. All right, well, then you just memorize which tissues. Okay, thank you very much. Yes. You're welcome. Yeah, do you have a question? Yeah, I have a quick question about the mocking. Yeah, the mocking. Yeah, so like, I'm not sure if I'm going to get it. Like, it doesn't matter. Anybody that it. even has an outside brown hall and an iron outside chance of getting an interview this semester should mock interview first. Okay. That doesn't mean, it doesn't preclude you from, let's say you do mock now, let's say you don't get an, uh, a, a true interview until February, mm -hmm. and you don't feel like you, you're ready because it's been so long, you could always come back and say, hey, Martino, mm -hmm. Dr. Brown Holland, could I do another quick session? But at least you got the first one out of it. So we're right. saying anybody that could potentially, even that much, have an just set of time. Okay. Does that sound good? Yeah. Yeah.
No problem. Yes, sir. Is that thing not going to use? What if, is that exclusively this semester going to be for non No, no. And so I put that in there because there's a lot of people that are in the mock interviews now that probably would have gone through the, the spring one. We're not precluding you from doing that. So there's people that did the DO, the MD, or the dental. Because I, I did have a committee interview. Right. But that but doesn't like, preclude you from doing this. I could have another. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Like, what's yeah. the time window? Because like, I have the interview schedule that's in a few weeks. It, just just sign up. I've got the schedule on it. You, you, you're not in. OK, so you wouldn't have gotten. Did you get the email that I sent out? I did, but I'm asking because I saw. Yeah, I, so I, you Brown wouldn't have Holland. gotten the Google Doc. So uh, I can okay. get you and who else asked about so, that. And Dr. Brown Holland mentioned there were. I'll send you the Google Doc. Pre there's, there's, a, there's a schedule that because I'm in charge of it. Okay. And right now, right now we don't have enough people. I, we have more slots than people that need them. Okay. So for right now, I don't care who signs up. All right, good. But it may get to the point in the near future where. You know, we have so many of the others that aren't in the three categories that we then say we're only going to do everybody who hasn't, mm -hmm. and then maybe we do another, maybe another day where we do like rehashes. So people that have done them in the spring that want another shot at it, and we'll add one for that, okay. and that way everybody gets a chance. But for right now, it's not really All right. Okay. So yeah, I'll send you, I'll send you the Google Doc, and then you can sign up. Yeah, that'd be good. Yeah, right, thanks. Absolutely. Yes, ma'am. Um, so, um, okay, let I, me just shut this reporter okay. off because I'm sure people aren't going to want to hear these conversations. I mean, they're like, what does that have to do with anatomy? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, so, I'm a 